My name's Josh. Sorry I didn't introduce myself earlier. Uh, this is a, uh, a great passage with tests and tears. Um, let's pray as we consider God's Word together. Now, Lord God, your great purpose is to reconcile the world to yourself in Christ Jesus. And so speak to us today, show us what it is you have done and turn us in our hearts towards you, whether that's for the first time or afresh, so that we might rejoice in this reconciliation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I do my best as a pastor to avoid giving you um, NBA illustrations, uh, but today I'm, I've, I, you know, I've lost restraint and I'm going to do it anyway. This is my personal hobby horse. Um, so, I hate the Los Angeles Lakers. I don't seem to say that clearly. But yet, my favourite player, LeBron, plays for them. So, I'm forced to watch uh, news about the Lakers all the time and it drives me to tears. Um, this hilarious thing happened in their off-season. They've got this player, Russell Westbrook, former league MVP. He's going downhill in his career. He's on the tail end. He's so bad, really. He's a detriment to the team. They need to get him off. Um, but Russell Westbrook in his career has had this great nemesis, this player named Patrick Beverly. And uh, years ago, Pat Bev dove into Westbrook's knee at a crucial, critical time in the season, put him out. And so they've had this great animosity, hatred ever since. And as Westbrook's career goes like this, Pat Bev's is kind of going like this. And they're at this moment in their careers where they're about equivalent players, where a former league MVP is about the level of a role player. Now, the last time the two played each other, Patrick Beverly mocked Russell Westbrook in a nationally televised game. Westbrook missed a shot, and then he missed another one, and Pat Bev ran around the perimeter of the basketball court holding his nose, saying, he stinks, he stinks. It blew up on Twitter, it blew up on the internet, it was everywhere. This off-season, the Los Angeles Lakers traded for Patrick Beverly and added him to their team with Russell Westbrook. <laughs> Now, I think they're doing that so that Westbrook will just leave of his own volition, but it <laughs> hasn't happened yet. And so, uh, last week they had the, the first kind of pre-season press conference where these two guys would meet for the first time to be on a team together. It was interesting what happened. It was very brief. Beverly walks into the room, smiles at Westbrook, goes over, dap each other up, bop, bop, and that's it. All smiles, we're all good, we're reconciled. Now I want to ask you, what do you think? <laughs> How deep does that go? Has there been change? <laughs> Has there been repentance? Is there any godly sorrow? No. <laughs> no, and the Los Angeles Lakers are going to be terrible for another season. <laughs> this, is going to, this is absolutely going to go down the toilet. Now you and I can see, can't we, that bup up doesn't bring reconciliation, right? That's, that's just there for the cameras. There's nothing, there's nothing substantial that's changed. There's no healing that's taken place. You and I know this is going to ruin the team. If they don't deal with this properly, this is going to be another lost season for the Lakers, which doesn't matter at all, but uh, it will be for LeBron. That is a very superficial form of reconciliation. And it might be that in your life, it, that's kind of the, the level, the degree of reconciliation you have at the moment with particular people. There's been past events, run around the court, he stinks. And yet, when you see each other, whether it's like the family gathering or in the workplace, you, you see each other, you smile, you say hi, bop, bop. <laughs> we're all good. But you know, don't you, that there's no actual reconciliation, there's no real change. The relationships are still broken, and there's great cost to that. Now, we experience this on a human level, don't we? But I want us to realise that we can have this same sort of thing with God. Now, if you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, you're exploring Christ, you're trying to work out what does He mean for your life, uh, there might not have ever even been the, the bup up moment with Him. You haven't actually come to Jesus to go, you know, are we right? Do we have peace? Has there been, you know, have we, have we put things in order? 
that you're not there that but I pray today you would be seeing what that would look like but for those of you who are Christians you you do trust in Jesus his Lord um, you you are united with him and yet we too uh, it's helpful to see as Christians we have a union with Christ we are reconciled to God in him we also have a communion with Christ that is our relationship with him and there can be experiences, seasons of the Christian life where you know that you've so, so sinned, so not dealt with it yet, that all that you really have in your communion with Christ is the superficial, up, up, yeah, we're okay. Um, and as you live in that space, without dealing with things, without turning and, and dealing with things, as we'll talk about in a moment, um, you're robbed of the joy of knowing Jesus, Often you're robbed of the assurance of your salvation. The hope of eternal life becomes dim. The communion you have with God's people gets undermined. And you realise you're living in a deep hypocrisy in life, with things undealt with. So you're robbed of the blessings of reconciliation. And so I pray today, whether you're, whether you're here exploring things with Christ, whether you're a Christian who is reconciled to God in Christ, um, that today's passage, we together will see how God moves us, how He so conducts the affairs of this life, that He causes us a godly sorrow that leads to repentance, which brings the blessing of reconciliation. A godly sorrow that leads to repentance and the blessing of reconciliation in Christ. So that's my big prayer. That's what I think this passage does in our lives as we explore it together today. So I'd love you have your Bibles with you. Open up uh, Genesis 42. We're looking at chapters 42 to 47. We're going to mostly focus on Joseph's tests and tears. Now, in our passage today, uh, I hope we can remember this, this great theme. That we see here God the conductor. He's not obviously at work in this moment. Like, he's... He, he doesn't kind of pop up with giant miracles and things. But you can see through this passage, he is the one conducting the scenes. As uh, this brilliant conductor is in her uh, orchestral arrangement. You see the passion and the verve here. But um, as uh, Joseph puts his brothers through two tests, we see God actually do a deep work in their lives. So I want you to see that as we go along. Which leads to a great reconciliation for the brothers. Uh, this is a really important thing. As we come to the New Testament, we see how the great story of God's re- saving work is fulfilled in Jesus. We know that God's great purpose, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, is to reconcile the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And that as God does this great reconciling work to, to bring people to himself, to bring peace, he also establishes peace amongst his people. Uh, the reconciliation with God in Christ, Ephesians 2 shows us that Uh, this reconciliation happens with God through Christ and with each other through Christ. We have peace both ways. Now, for Israel's sons, Jacob's sons, all of this is, in a sense, in jeopardy. Uh, Jacob, whose name is renamed as Israel, his sons have proven themselves to be murderers. They have sold their brother Joseph into slavery, They've deceived their father. Reuben the eldest has slept with his father's concubine. Judah the fourth eldest turned away from his family, away from his father's God, walked into great sexual sin and spiritual backsliding. And so this family, as we enter Genesis 42, is fractured, failing, morally bankrupt. And as we start chapter 42, uh, sorry, chapter yeah, 42, we see that they're in immediate danger. They will die unless they can buy grain. And so as we see God orchestrate this situation, conducting the affairs here, running, putting the family through these tests through Joseph, God's not only going to save the lives of Jacob and his family, and so keep his promises to Abraham, he's going to do it through a deep work. A deep work that first brings godly sorrow, then repentance, and finally the blessing of reconciliation. He's going to do it all through the man he's chosen. 
So we're going to follow these three things together today. Godly sorrow, repentance and reconciliation. Let's start part one with uh, the way God works through Joseph to bring a godly sorrow. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 42. Here we have the first journey of the brothers to Egypt and back again. Jacob learns that there's grain in Egypt and says to his sons, why do you keep looking at each other? There's grain in Egypt, go there, buy some for us so that we may live and not die. And he sends them, but he holds back his new favourite boy, Rachel's second son, Benjamin, afraid that harm is going to come to him. Joseph is the governor of Egypt, second only to Pharaoh. He's stored up grain and he's feeding the starving nation of Egypt and the nations of the world. His brothers come into them, come in, and what do they do? Verse 6, bow down to him with their faces to the ground. This is the first of kind of three main occasions through this story where Joseph's dream becomes reality. His brothers come before him, bowing with their faces to the ground. And as they do so, Joseph remembers his dream, verse 9. This is what God has said would happen. And it must have been this lightning bolt moment where all of the purposes of God come together for him and he can see what God has done and prepared him for this moment to rescue his brothers, to rescue his father, to save them from death itself. And so he revealed himself and straight away they went and they got his father and brought them. That's not what happens, is it? (laughs) No, it doesn't. What happens? Joseph pretends to be a stranger, verse 7. He speaks harshly to them, speaking in Egyptian through an interpreter. He treats them as spies and he goes on to demand proof that they're not spies by asking them to bring back to him their youngest brother who's been left at home, their father's favourite, little Benjamin. And until they do so, they have to leave another brother with him as a prisoner, Simeon. And if they won't do this, the threat is they will all die. Why does Joseph do that? He remembered his dreams. He's like, this is the moment, right? This is what God's been preparing me for. I'm here. I'm going to save you. I see you. But rather than just go forward and rescue them, rather than have this great moment of reconciliation... He plans a sneaky trick. Why does he do this? Well, I think the meaning of this test is revealed in the effect it has on the brothers. And then that's confirmed by Joseph's tears. Have a look at what the brothers say in verses 21. They said to one another, Surely we are being punished because of our brother. Not that they realize that Joseph is the one literally putting this punishment on them. They think we're being punished by God because of what we did in the past, selling Joseph into slavery. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. Do you hear their speech? We are being punished because of our brother. God is orchestrating this moment, bringing judgment on us because of what we did to Joseph. And they recall their intense guilt. They dredge up the memory of that moment where their pleading little brother was thrown into a pit and then sold to slavers. And Reuben's words, we sinned against the boy, he he owns that guilt. It was against the boy and it was against God we sinned. And this is going to be the moment where God will demand an account. In Genesis 9 verses 5 and 6, after the flood, God said to Noah, For your lifeblood I will surely demand an accounting. I'll demand an accounting from every animal and from each human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. This is the judgment moment. God is finding our sins out. And here is Joseph's purpose. 
Here is the conductor God orchestrating the moment. Unveiling to them their guilt. Bringing them to a recognition and an ownership of what we did to our brother. And they they speak to one another. They're all saying this to each other. Reuben speaks up and Joseph, he's right there in front of them. And they don't realize it's him. And he understands what they're saying. And as he hears the, the recognition of guilt and sorrow well up from amongst his brothers, what does he do? Well, see there, he turns away from them, verse 24, and begins to weep. He weeps. This is the first of four times in this story we'll hear Joseph weep. He must have relived the intensity of that distress and how he'd been sinned against. Here was his opportunity for revenge. But no, it's not revenge he's pursuing, is it? It's something deeper. He's pursuing godly sorrow in his brothers. Recognition in his brothers. The uncovering of guilt in his brothers. He hides himself to bring out this deeper thing. He's not just going to save them from hunger. He's going to work a deeper thing. And then he raises the stakes. The blokes have come, each of them with a sack. I brought my own sack from home. And uh, they've come with their money, some silver to pay brought my daughter's uh, savings jar. She hasn't saved much at the moment. And Joseph says to his steward, take their money that they brought to buy grain so they wouldn't die and put it back in the sack. And he does. And off they go, unaware that their money is back in the sack. They stop on the way home. One of them opens the sack to get feed for his donkey. He finds it, the silver in the mouth of his sack. The trap has been set. How do you think they felt? Were they delighted? They got their money back? They're terrified. What does this mean? And as they go to their father and explain what has happened and how they've had to leave Simeon behind in prison and now one of them's got money in their sack, they all open up their sacks and there it is, the silver in the mouth of the sacks. And they're terrified. Their hearts sink, they tremble, their father is frightened. And they say in verse 28, what is this that God has done to us? God has done to us. You see, they see the hand of God in this moment, the one who's orchestrating the events of this situation. They see it, God is inflicting more punishment on us. He's putting our lives at risk. If if this Egyptian ruler thought we were spies and now finds out we've got our money back, he's going to assume we're thieves as well. There's no way we're going to be able to go back and buy grain. He's going to come after us. And there's nothing we could do. And as they explain this to Jacob, their father, this magnifies their guilt even more. See what God's doing here? Their father Jacob says to them, verse 36, You've deprived me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now to get Simeon back, you want to take Benjamin? Everything is against me. Isn't it interesting? Jacob puts together the the loss of Joseph with the loss of Simeon and then the loss of Benjamin. This is exactly what Joseph intended. The boy's guilt is being uncovered. You have deprived me of my children, Jacob says to them. And he refuses to entrust his son Benjamin to Reuben. You see, through Joseph's actions, the brothers see the hand of God. He's conducting these things, unveiling something in them, working something deeper in them. Bringing about in them a godly sorrow. An ownership of their guilt. Do you see what godly sorrow is, right? It's this recognition of the wickedness of what they have done in the sight of God. God the judge sees it, knows it, it's not hidden. He demands an accounting for it. It recognizes wickedness. The brothers own their responsibility. 
They say, yes, this is because of what we did to Joseph. They own their responsibility. They fear God. Rightly, they fear his judgment. And they're grieved by the harm that they have done to their brother and their father. They're grieved by it. Friends, are you trying to bury your guilt only to have God dig it up? You know, a lot of life is suppressing the past. A lot of our energy goes towards suppressing the past, not dealing with the things that we've done. Is God digging it up? Is He so orchestrating the events of your life that He's calling you to pay attention to these things, to dig up a godly sorrow? There is a difference, isn't there, between a godly sorrow and a worldly sorrow. Let me just draw this out with you for a moment. 2 Corinthians speaks about this, Paul to the Corinthians chapter 7. He says in verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. You see the difference there? There is a godly sorrow, a sorrow that's directed towards God, that's pleasing in His sight. It leads to repentance, which leads to salvation. It leaves no regret in this life. But there's another kind of sorrow as well, where you are sad about the things that you've done, but that's where it ends. You just re- you regret it. Oh, I really regret that. And it leads nowhere except to death. And so I just want to pause for a moment and ask you, are you working really hard right now to to kind of bury what's actually going on in your life or in the past? You're trying to hide the reality of your situation. Maybe it's from your parents, maybe it's from your friends, maybe it's from your workers, maybe it's from people here at church and you're trying to just bury that reality, not dealing with it, not honest about it. You regret it, sure, I want to ask you, is God digging it up? And if He is, just know for a second, that's a really good thing. Joseph could have said to his brothers, hey, it's me, Joseph. Have some food, let's go. He's doing a deeper thing, a more kind thing, a more loving thing, a better thing. He's digging deep into their lives to unearth their guilt to bring about a godly sorrow because this is going to lead to repentance. And repentance will lead to the blessing of reconciliation. And so if you're here at the moment, you're feeling convicted as you think about your past or your present, just know that this is the mercy and kindness of God to you. To dig it up, to lead you to repentance and the blessings of reconciliation. Don't let it stop in regret. Don't let it stop in regret. All right, let's move on. See what happens next. Repentance. Godly sorrow brings repentance. And it does for the brothers. Now we have the second journey to Egypt, and following that, the second test. We're into chapter 43. The famine is still severe, 43 verse 1. When they've eaten the grain they brought from Egypt, the father said to them, go back and buy us a little more food. You can hear the tension, right? It's buy this food or we die. We have to go back. Uh, it's the classic, the pain of uh, not changing has to outweigh the pain of change. And so Jacob's like, okay, <laughs> okay. I said, I'd said, don't go back because you can't take Benjamin. But then Judah steps forward and says, do you hear what Judah says? His promise, verses 1 to 14. Judah says, uh, his dad, verse 3, The man warned us solemnly, You will not see my face again unless your brother is with you. And then Judah shows how deep this godly sorrow has worked in his own heart. He promises to guarantee Benjamin's safety. Look at verse 8. Judah said to Israel, his father, Send the boy along with me. And we will go at once, so that we and you and our children may live and not die. I myself 
will guarantee his safety. You can hold me personally responsible for him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him here before you, I will bear the blame before you all my life. Did you hear Judah's promise? What a change has God worked in this man. Judah was the one who sold Joseph into slavery. Now he promises to bear the blame if anything would go wrong with his second favoured son. And so Jacob sends his boys off and prays in verse 14 that God Almighty would grant them mercy before the man. And yet, even as they go, as readers, we sort of wonder for a moment, don't we? Will this, will this man Judah, who has made other big promises in the past, he promised his son Shelah to Tamar, you remember that a couple of weeks ago, and he never delivered on it, will he in fact keep his promise now? Or is this kind of a promise of convenience? It's like, if I don't promise this, well, we're going to die. So I have to get dad to get the little kid, that little spoilt brat, to come down to Egypt, otherwise I'm going to die. My wife's going to die. My kids are going to die. It's a promise of convenience. How do you get this old boy, this old man, to part with the favorite son? Is it just a promise of convenience? Well, as they arrive in Egypt, Joseph meets them with mercy. It's extraordinary, verse 15. Joseph meets them with mercy. And the things that happen in this moment all spring out of this one thing. Joseph sees Benjamin, verse 16. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Take these men to my house, slaughter an animal, prepare a meal, they're to eat with me at noon. He greets them with great hospitality, generosity. And the brothers are frightened. They think Joseph's getting us to his house so he can attack us because he knows that we stole the silver. <laughs> they're petrified. And as they explain this to Joseph's steward and say, we don't know where the money came from. Here, have it all back, have it all back, have it all back. He's like, slow down, boys, slow down. God has been merciful to you. Verse 23, he says to them, lads, it's all right. It's all right, don't be afraid. Your God, the God of your father, has given you treasure in your sacks. I received your silver. He says, God's put your money there. It's mercy, isn't it? They met with mercy. And not only do they receive the silver, verse 23, they receive their brother back as well. And he brings Simeon out to them. And then at dinner, Joseph sees Benjamin again, verse 29. And the brothers experience mercy again. Joseph seats them in age order. And they're like, how the heck did he know that? <laughs> and then down the end of the table, the little guy, Benjamin, he gets five times as much from Joseph's own, own table. What's going on? Well, again, Joseph's tears, I think, are a clue. Joseph weeps when he sees Benjamin. And he weeps the second time. It's down in verse 30. He's deeply moved. Why does he weep? Well, again, it must have dredged up the past for him. He sees his dad's new favourite son, his own little brother, and he likely sees all that he's lost in his life, all that he's lost in his relationship with his father. But the bigger thing here is that he's weeping because of what this reveals about the change in his brothers. They didn't abandon Simeon. They didn't sell him into slavery to save themselves. They didn't trade their brother for money in their sacks like they did to him. He's seeing repentance as he sees his brother. But he presses further and lays a second trap. He tests them again. Chapter 44. Has this godly sorrow truly brought repentance or is it just about self-preservation? Just about self-preservation. And so... Joseph gives instructions to his steward, chapter 44, verses 1 to 13. This time, he puts a, his own silver cup in the mouth of the youngest one's sack. And uh, just so you know how to follow along, here I, I've got my own little silver cup at home. This is uh, Annie's little thing, 
for putting precious things in. You can imagine his Joseph silver cup of divination. Finds Benjamin's sack, in it goes, trap number two. And the lads all head off, feasted, happy, with peace. And then after them comes the steward. He's like, boys, someone has stolen my master's silver cup. And they're like, no way! We wouldn't do such a thing. We were just having dinner together. Did you see how much we liked each other? We even offered to give you the money back. And he's like, lads, we're going to have to search the bags. They're like, look, if any... They say, look, we are so confident we're innocent. We would never do this. We are not this kind of people. If anybody has the cup, they're going to die. You can put them to death. He's like, well, hold on a second. <laughs> hold on a second. Whoever's got the cup, they're going to come back and they will be a slave. And they're like, that's fine. Let's go for it. And they start at the top. Reuben's sack, empty. Simeon's sack, empty. Levi's sack, empty. And Judah's sack, empty. And like, see, see, see what he's... It keeps going, Issachar, Zebulun, Naphtali, Dan, Asher. I'm going to forget the names now, so I'll stop there. It's not a good, didn't it? Benjamin. The little one, the favoured one. They pull up in the sack. There it is, right in the mouth of the sack. What do the brothers do at that point? Their father's favourite son. They tear their clothes apart in anguish. These brothers who had taken Joseph and thrown him in a pit and torn his robe and presented it to their father to deceive him because they so hated this favoured son, so despised their father in his favouritism. What do they do when his new favoured son is caught? Well, they tear their own cloaks, tear their clothes in grief and anguish. How could this be? And what do they say as they come back? Judah again connects this with what God sees about them in their guilt regarding Joseph, I think. Verse 16, God has uncovered your servant's guilt. And Judah says to Joseph, we are now... Your slaves, every single brother, humbles himself to, and offers to become the slaves of this Egyptian ruler. But Joseph's test isn't complete yet. He says, no, 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 you can all go. It's only the one who had the cup. Do you see him test them again, deeply, right in the same place that they failed with Joseph? Here it is, all over again. Will they leave their father's favourite, a slave in Egypt? Will they not just escape, but go in peace? With all the silver they brought the first time, and all the silver they brought the second time, all they have to do is sell their little brother into slavery again. It's all it would take. But here is Judah's speech, and you can see how godly sorrow has produced repentance. Judah speaks, verse 14 to 34. I'll just highlight a couple of things from it. The big thing is, he says this, take me in the place of Benjamin for the sake of my father. Take me in the place of Benjamin for the sake of my father. See that right at the end of his speech, this is his request, verse 33. Please let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy. Let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come on my father. See what change God has worked in Judah. His concern now is all about his father. I could not do this to my father. I could not deprive him of his beloved favoured son. And so he loves his father, he pursues his father's joy, he puts his father's favourite son above himself. It's a complete reversal of how he treated Joseph. The repentance is 180 degrees difference, isn't it? He offers himself as a slave in place of his father's favourite. 
And friends, this is what repentance looks like. The godly sorrow that brings repentance. It brings a complete new heart, a change. It's a reorientation of who you're living for and what you love. It's God first. It's seeking to please Him. And it leads to a complete change of life. If repentance doesn't lead to new actions, you haven't repented, you haven't turned around. You haven't quite got it. The worldly sorrow just lands in regret and there's no personal change. But godly sorrow brings repentance, a new heart, a new way of life. And so as you think about that thing on your mind, on your heart, that God is stirring up to sorrow, no, it can't end there, right? If that relationship is, there's been that hurt there, you have to actually change how you're acting. Whatever that means. You're going to need to move out. You're going to need to seek forgiveness. You need to pray and ask God to be changed on the inside. A change of what you love, a change of how you live. Repentance leads to action. Worldly sorrow leads to regret and death. And it ends, godly sorrow, through repentance, it ends in the blessing of reconciliation. Just briefly, this story finishes over chapters 45 to 47, with all the purposes of God being fulfilled through Joseph. Joseph then, chapter 45, reveals himself to his brothers. I am Joseph, who you sold into slavery. It's a great one. I've probably said that every time he said his name from then on. Hi, it's Joseph, who you sold into slavery. But what does he do with that? Well, he then comforts his brothers. He brings them close to him again. He could have used that to just cut them off forever, but no, he says to them, see now what God has done through this moment. You meant it for evil, but see what God has achieved four times in chapter 45, and we'll reflect on this much more next week, I think. He says in verse 5, it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Verse 7, God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth, to save your lives. Verse 8, so then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Verse 9, God has made me Lord of all of Egypt. He brings them near and comforts them in the sovereign knowledge that God has been at work to bring about their great deliverance. This is gospel, his good news to them. And then he weeps over them in this beautiful moment of reconciliation, verses 14 and 15. Throws his arms around his brother Benjamin and weeps. And Benjamin embraces him and he weeps. Then he kisses all his brothers and wept over them. And then they all talked together. Now that is beautiful, isn't that moment of reconciliation? It comes about because Joseph sees Benjamin sees Judah offer himself, sees that they've turned 180, sees the work of God in their lives. Godly sorrow has produced repentance, which has led to the blessing of reconciliation. And at the end of the story, Jacob and his family are brought to Egypt. Joseph is reunited with his father. There's more tears. And Pharaoh gives them the land of Goshen. Now, friends, God is doing a great work in this world to reconcile people to himself in Christ. If you don't know Jesus, that's the deep reconciliation that you need. To the brothers, they saw their sin, they recognized their guilt before God, and even as they experienced, I think, the forgiveness of Joseph, they were at the same time coming to terms with the God that they needed forgiveness with through his mediator. They end up restored together in Egypt. The people of God saved, rescued, and reconciled. And that is the most important relationship that you need to deal with. Not just the one between one another, family, friends, whatever that is, but the one with God. And the comfort that we have is the good news, the gospel to us, is that God has not just been at work in your life to uncover things. He's been at work to send His Son who bore our sins in His death on the cross so that we could be forgiven and be right with Him. He's made peace possible. 
Be reconciled to God. And if you are a Christian, know that the joy of that reconciliation, the blessings, the communion with God that you experience, is heightened, sweetened, experienced as you repent and turn to Him. Friends, this also helps you to see, doesn't it, the pattern for our relationships. This is not like a uh, cookie cutter, one, two, three, this is how you fix all your relationship problems. But it is helpful, isn't it? Godly sorrow brings repentance, which can lead to reconciliation. Don't leave today without dealing with that. Don't stop at a worldly sorrow. That brings death. But a godly sorrow leads to repentance and salvation. Let me pray. Father, as we reflect on our own lives and your orchestrating work, as you dig up, reveal, expose the things of our own hearts and past, please work this great mercy in our lives. Have this kindness upon us. Lead us to a godly sorrow. Turn our hearts towards you. Change our lives. And bring us the blessed joy of reconciliation. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.